Welcome to the season finale of Tomorrow is the Problem. I'm Donna honar Pauline Oliveros developed the practice of deep listening in the early 1970s. Oliveros was a composer and a pioneering electronic musician whose sonic meditations pushed the boundaries of what many would consider music. Oliveros's work interrogated the difference between the involuntary, purely physical act of hearing and the voluntary, conscious effort required to listen. She described deep listening as a way of listening in every possible way, to everything possible, to hear no matter what you are doing, and regarded deep listening as her life's work. In today's episode, we're going to contemplate listening deeply and the care and intentionality that it both requires and renews. Our guests will help us cultivate the skill of listening to the past, the natural world, and of course, to one another. We'll learn to approach listening as a type of attunement that exceeds the usual call and response we associate with musical, communicative, or background sounds. This means listening to silence or attending to quiet sounds that may not necessarily announce themselves immediately in a practice that inculcates a form of meditation and resonance that can allow listening to become an ethical imperative. Before we begin, take a moment to listen deeply. Your ears are instruments, a path of openness to the world. Consider the waves of sound all around us, gently or violently colliding as we find a moment to attune ourselves to our sonic atmospheres. What do you hear? Throughout this season, we've introduced the peril and power of deep sounds. We brought you the unique soundscape of our home city, and we thought about the structural qualities of jazz that make it more than a musical genre, but a way of being in the world. In today's episode, we invite you to approach listening beyond the individual sensory relationship to hearing, but rather to consider listening as a collective and ethical practice that will help reconsider the way listening is tied to being in relation with others and also to justice. When you're alone and too tired even to turn on any of your devices, you let yourself linger in a past stacked among your pillows. Usually you are nestled under blankets and the house is empty. Sometimes the moon is missing. And beyond the windows, the low gray ceiling seems approachable. Its dark light dims in degrees, depending on the density of clouds, and you fall back into that which gets reconstructed as metaphor. So begins Citizen, an American lyric, a book-length lyric poem by poet and playwright Claudia Rankin the 2022 Art and Research Center keynote lecturer at ICA Miami, to whom this episode also owes a debt. Rankin considers the openness inherent in deep listening in her own work, where listening isn't just a given. It is an active practice that involves the sensibilities we might attribute to poetry, sensory, meditative, and resonant. Wherever you may be, we ask you to approach this episode with these sensibilities in mind. Listening deeply is by no means immune to the politics of hearing that shapes our perception. A commitment to listening ethically forces us to acknowledge and confront our biases. Nina Eidsheim, a scholar, writer, and professor of musicology at UCLA, deconstructs the language of listening. I don't think about sound anymore as the thing that you can maybe measure with some kind of instrument. But uh, my definition of sound now is uh, that it's an intermaterial vibrational practice or an intermaterial vibrational event. Because, as you know, sound is energy and that energy it cannot live or exist in itself. Intermaterial vibrational practice is a sophisticated way of saying that sound can only exist when there is some kind of material for it to pass through a familiar concept to sci-fi fans and film buffs. You may know that the movie Alien has the tagline, in space, nobody can hear you scream. And that's, of course, meant to be humorous. But the reason nobody can hear you scream in space is because there's no material, uh, there's no air there. So there's nothing like air or like wood or like metal or like water 
for that energy to be transmitted through. So the thing that we call sound, it wouldn't exist unless it was transmitted through something. So most typically, the sound that we listen to is transmitted through air very, very often. And then as that energy moves, makes its way through the air, it goes into our inner ear or to our eardrum. And then it's transmitted from the air to the eardrum and it's vibrating in the eardrum and then to our inner ear. So when you hear sound, the thing that you call sound, you are its own loudspeaker. You're projecting it or displaying it to yourself inside yourself. So, you know, if we shift the definition of sound to, you know, an intermaterial vibrational practice or energy that is transmitted through material, then it's very hard to know when it starts and ends. And then it's very hard to know what silence versus sound. Nina's conception of sound renders the human brain as a kind of receptor, amplifier, and recording device all in one. First, we receive the energy through the movements of particles in the air. Our physiology understands how to translate those waves of energy into signals that our neurons then register as sound. Within this framing, whether we realize it or not, we are very active participants in the formulation of sound. And how does thinking about sound in this relational manner change how we might approach listening? If we start to think about sound in this way, We're always implicated. We cannot listen at arm's length. We're not divided from it or divorced from it. And also we cannot make sounds in the world without thinking about who it's touching or who it's going to be transmitted through. So again, the definition is an intermaterial vibrational practice. So intermaterial means your materiality and my materiality. So the sound is moving from my materiality to your materiality. And that's why I think I feel that I'm transformed physically by listening to certain sounds or having certain sounds transmitted through me. And that's also why we can feel destroyed by sound. And I don't think it's necessarily a certain kind of sound that is dangerous or destructive. It's how we meet that sound with our materiality in that time and place. And it has to do with uh, our agency. Did we decide that we wanted to be part of that sound or were we forced to take that sound into our materiality. Nina's conception of sound not only helps us understand the social conditions for listening, it also shows how our own biases inform how we process sound. So when we fix sound, when we believe that we can know sound, I have called that a figure of sound, you know, like a figure of speech is not the thing that it really is, but it implies something. That's how... I think about notes or the things that we think we can know about music or sound. It's just a figure of sound. So when we say A, for instance, the note A, it's not something that actually exists in reality. It's just an indication that we as a society or a musical culture have created a kind of system that we we have been using. These figures of sound are susceptible to cognitive bias and often become self-reinforcing. But when we believe that... We can know sound, like an A, and then we believe we can know people through their voice. And we have also created practices around voices that signal, for instance, geography, ethnicity, gender, etc., class. Then when we hear that sound, we take that to be the proof of those categories that we believe in and that we invest in as a society. So if I hear a voice that has the sound that I have come to, I've been practiced into, I've been taught to understand as a female voice, then I hear that voice and I say, that's a female, that's a woman. Why, you would ask? Ah, because her voice, the voice is a female voice. And this sound is the interiority of that person and that interiority must be female, so it's the fem- a female And then we do the same with race. So we can say, that's the sound of an old black woman, or that's the sound of a young black man, or that's the sound of an Asian woman. And when we hear that sound, that sound is just a sonic category that we as a society have. We have both created them. These are also cultures, you know, communities that have created the sound together. But when we have them stand in for race and we believe in that sound to be true and to tell us something truthfully and something essential about that person, we make that sound prove to us or be the evidence of that race, for instance, is truthful. 
or is true. In essence, so if we believe something like gender exists, we're going to hear gender in people's voices. If we believe something like class or race exists, we're going to hear that as well, even when we listen to music. Nia's book, The Race of Sound, shows us how sound contains important information, but not in the way we may think. When we choose to regard sound as a relational exercise and we question the destructive, reductive, stereotypical signifiers embedded in figures of sound, we learn more about the listener than the speaker. It says, for instance, that the voice is not the speaker, it's the listener. So when I hear that sound that I believe is the sound of a female, I am the person who originated that statement, that observation, not the voice. So from that kind of framework, if I want to know more about the world, I would have to ask myself, how is it that I came up with that designation? How is it? Why is it? that I hear this voice as a female voice. So any assertions or any observations I make about the world sonically, I believe I should turn back to myself, return back to myself and ask, why is it that I heard it as as this, rather than making it that figure of sound that I mentioned earlier, making it a objective observation. We can start to ask, once one gets some kind of distance and doesn't fix the sound around one, one can start to think about how about what would happen if I heard it in this kind of way? What might be other listening practices? Can I learn new listening practices? What if I just make myself hear it through another sense? Understanding that the information we ascribe to others' voices is socially constructed liberates the senses. The freeing aspect of Nina's methodology also manifests itself in the courses she teaches. As a professor, Nina guides her students to develop a new lexicon for describing sounds, unconstrained by the racialized constructs ascribed to them. You put this music in your mouth, you bite into it, and you taste it. We go into that imaginary Often it's in the rejection. You could say, I can ask you, is this really hot? Is it burning your tongue? And you would say, no, 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 it's cold. And I just ask you, is it a kind of smooth flavor or is it explosive in your mouth? And you would say, oh, it's definitely explosive. And I can ask you, does it crunch or is it gooey? You would know what it isn't. And by knowing what it isn't, you can maybe move towards what it is. And by trying to sense music or sound in this very deliberate way, you would develop a much, or I develop a much richer understanding of it. And I don't go to these fixed notions of what it is. And what I've come to see too is that, or understand when I try to do this, is that we have a really poorly developed vocabulary for talking about and thinking about sound. So I always develop new dictionaries, often in groups. We have kind of crowdsourced dictionaries. And then we use those dictionaries to write about the same music that we maybe have written about for 20 years or 10 years or, you know, two weeks. And then in the end, you know, we want to talk to people who understand what we're saying. We do want to communicate so we can bring it back to vocabulary that is more familiar. But by going, kind of disrupting the very typical patterns that we would engage in by just thinking through sound, I believe that even when we return to sound, we're able to say something different and feel and communicate something different than we would have if we just used those very long established thinking patterns and listening patterns. By decoupling voices from the labels we give them and the societal constructs those words are tethered to, we allow ourselves to really hear. This practice of ethical listening extends beyond how we relate to one another and into how we relate to nature. Hi, my name is Jana Winner. I am at the moment sitting in my studio just north uh, of Oslo. Why is sound particularly important? I think sound, it comes very close to you, you know. Sound is all around you. It's uh, it's a very physical medium. It comes very directly to you, kind of thing. 
different from something visual that is more on a distance necessarily because of our eyes. We can also sense the sound it's all around us, you know, it's behind us, it's, it's everywhere. Jana Vinderen is a Norwegian sound artist. Her work involves setting up spaces where strangers are seated together to absorb her intricate field recordings of underwater sounds. Jana's large-scale installations have appeared all over the world, including here in Miami, when her piece The Art of Listening Underwater was commissioned in 2019 for Art Basel. And all of Jana's work strives to accomplish the same goal. Through sensitizing people towards listening, you start to hear your own environment also more. You get more sensitized to uh, to listen to the birds or hear. I just recently heard there's not just a mouse under the snow. I start to hear the squirrel here in the trees. You know, you start hearing the little creatures chewing away on stuff. So you get more kind of sensitized and, and through that, I think you become more aware of you, the environment you live in and through more awareness, uh, more care, I think. Jana is particularly intent on tracing the sounds of the ocean, a space we humans have come to think of as devoid of sound. In fact, the sea is awash in sound. The thrashing movements of fish, dolphins chatter, conversations between whales, the scuttling of hermit crabs along the ocean floor. Yana even told us she can hear the differences between coral reefs. She gathers these sounds by submerging special, highly sensitive waterproof microphones called hydrophones, designed to capture the ocean's sonic nooks and crannies. These recordings become the basis of her work. And Yana would be the first to tell you that, while the ocean is quiet, it is by no means silent. I wanted to go to really, really detailed small sounds uh, of the underwater insects and of the fish. And I would go out in the boat. I always kind of float the cables away from the boat. And not always, but I try to do that if there's choppy water, because you get a lot of slapping sound on the actual boat that you might not want so much of that then you float the cable away a bit. You have to be very quiet yourself and you cannot have anyone stepping around in the boat or uh, speaking too loudly because this will transmit into the water. So, you know, all the fish, they can hear what we're talking about in the boat. So you need to be very quiet. And this is, uh, of course, a massive uh, problem if you don't want to record humans because humans are around most of the planet uh, all the time. So um, when you start recording with hydrophones, you will realize how loud we are uh, with engines, with, you know, kind of ferries or kind of shipping traffic, all this kind of seismic testing, you know, air guns, sonars, military sonars, enormous strong signals. So I would be trying to go out when there isn't so much humans around, if possible. And then I would record, uh, depending totally on what I hear, you know, and I will stay as long as I would like to stay, if it's possible, or as long as it's possible. And I go back and start uh, logging the sounds, writing notes and listening back to everything as soon as I can. But we haven't always been this noisy. But with the underwater, it's, we haven't really spoken about it for a while. But this, it's like a bit forgotten since uh, industrialization, you know. I think people were more aware of the sound environment underwater before. I think we just over, you know, made so much edging sounds to kind of forgot that there is a massive sound environment underwater. For example, most people would be surprised to learn the names of many fish are onomatopoeic, even in Norwegian. A lot of fish, you know, have this name according to what sound it makes, you know, for example, from from long time ago. The croaker, the drumfish and the snapper, you know, all of these are making, there's just like sound. And uh, in Norway, we have something called knurr, which is like, um, you know, it's what it sounds like. It's the like knurr when you, it makes the knurr, you know, <laughs> and it's called knurr. Noise pollution is a very real problem, and not just for Jana and her hydrophones out on the board. Underwater, because we 
have not been so much aware of the sound environment recently. There has not been so much restrictions on putting a lot of sound there, you know, and making shipping lanes that goes straight through the habitat of, for example, fish spawning. And they are using a lot of sound in meeting each other, you know, or listening to the environment and also in schooling when they are together. Like a shoal of fish, a school of fish. They use a lot of sound also. And then also to orientate themselves. And whales, that the mammals of the sea, they are meeting each other. They can hear each other on long, 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 long distances. But if we have a shipping lane straight through uh, these long distances where they hear each other by the shipping will mask the sound and they will not hear each other so they will not meet you know they will not be aware of that there is like another one over, right over there you know but it's just overwhelmed by the sound from from human activity oil in oil exploration you know with uh, seismic testing you know and this air guns it can scare whales away from feeding grounds until they starve This piece was composed to show the ways human-manufactured sounds interact with and disrupt animal life, as well as offer glimpses of possible future soundscapes. It outlines what a well-managed future could look like, with floating turbines, less ship traffic, and quieter propellers, alongside a poorly managed one, where bigger storms, smaller glaciers, and increased underwater mining and pile driving all result in fewer kelp forests and depleted coral reefs. Often when we think about noise pollution, we tend to forget that underneath it, there is already a whole world of sound emanating from the ecosystem around us, one that needs to be restored, just as rainforests need to be restored after clear cutting. But unlike other forms of pollution... And we can stop the sound and it's totally gone. And then the environment is rid of this polluter, you know, kind of thing. You know, work on that at the moment. And of course, how human sounds is masking the sounds uh, for the different creatures and hopefully helping to make everyone more aware of the influence that we have on the sound environment on the water so that we can be taking more care. Just as Jana helped us reconsider listening as an act of understanding the environment, and Nina Eitzheim helped us explore listening as an act of understanding against racial or gender biases, our final guest helped us approach listening as an act of attunement linked to our other senses across history. Because the responsibility we have to one another and to the earth is a responsibility we also share towards the past. Take a moment to conjure up the image of your favorite photograph. Maybe it's a photo of you with a loved one or a beautiful sunset you captured on a walk home. Hold that image in your mind. Now, consider the sounds that the image evokes. Can you hear the rain on the roof above your head? Laughter from friends and family behind the camera, the sound of a car passing by just outside the frame, or the music you were listening to at the time. If you were standing next to someone, can you hear the rustling of the fabric where your body's touched? We usually treat photographs as silent, focusing on what we see within the frame. But Tina Kemp, a writer, professor, and Black feminist theorist of visual culture and contemporary art at Brown University, urges us to reevaluate this assumption, suggesting that photographs should be regarded as quiet, not silent. To me, quiet photography is an invitation, an invitation to learn by listening, as opposed to putting words into somebody's mouth or putting a label onto an image, as opposed to deciding that it is only the facts that matter. What listening offers Tina's methodology is to approach these images beyond their optical presence, 
through sensory or affective feelings that might be hidden in the image itself. By listening to the images, Tina can attend to the quieter resonances that the image holds within it. What we mistake for quiet is an assumption that silence actually exists in the world. Quiet, to me, is a profoundly overlooked sonic modality. It is overlooked because we think of it as an absence, when in fact it is a really subtle presence. And we tend to look away from it because we are attuned, right? We are sort of trained to focus on the presence of sound as expressive of something and that the quote-unquote absence of sound is an absence of expression. Tina likens the quiet power of photographs to that of humming. Humming is one of those quiet, ambient intensities that is incredibly fulsome. It is incredibly expressive, but it is not loud, (laughs) right? It doesn't take up an entire room, but it can be as expressive as a scream or a cry or a laugh. And so what I'm trying to get people to do in thinking about quiet as an intensely expressive modality is to attend to that which is not always directly confronting us, but is under the surface slightly, that gets you to go underneath the surface and make certain kinds of recognitions. Tina's own route to this sonic modality came as a surprise. While she was studying and writing about the Black experience in post-war Germany, a community whose history has not been well documented, and about whom there are very few archival documents. Tina, who originally trained as a historian, began conducting interviews for her own oral history of people whose lives had intersected with World War II. And that that fascination with the history of how Black Germans understood themselves in relationship to the Nazi regime and in relationship to German society moving forward was a history that compelled me for many years and moved me from doing work in oral history to doing work on photography, vernacular photography in particular, because what was really important to me was seeing images of Black Germans that told stories about their lives and their histories that in a lot of ways was even more powerful than the actual narratives that they were sharing with me because they were images that showed them situated in their families, in their society, in their neighborhoods, in their locality. And so that's how I became preoccupied with the power of images to tell stories that exceed words. This discovery led to a lifetime of scholarship about how we should experience photographs and their subjects. Photography was created as a medium that was supposed to give us an index, as real an index as possible, of whatever it was capturing within the frame. So unlike painting or other forms of representation, photography was always about the veracity of something, right? It could capture something that was both in quotes and out of quotes real. And the state historically leveraged that to use it to be able to quite literally capture the image of people in order to be able to manage us, to manage us, right? To manage our movement for example, through passports, to keep us in place, like in prisons, to be able to successfully propagate a narrative of colonization, for example, in ethnographic photographs. So photography's claim to be able to tell the truth about individuals is something that states have leveraged since the beginning of photography. But what I've been interested in, both in relationship to these state forms or state adjudicated forms 
of photography as well as the private and personal photography made by individuals themselves is I find it fascinating the way in which subjects are able to subvert even the most sort of oppressive or repressive practices of photographic capture. So the juxtaposition between family photographs and identification photography, even something as regressive as uh, mugshots and prison photographs, to me, it's not that there, there's not a, a, a gaping hole or chasm between the two, because both of them have within them the capacity to be turned around, to be used to make statements that were not intended to be made. With this newfound attunement, we asked Tina to read a photo for us. Actually, it's, it's one of two photographs that sent me on this journey. And they're portraits, but they're street portraits of a young Black German girl who eventually became an extraordinary Black German activist and folk singer named Fazia Janssen. And these are photos of her when she was about, I'd say, six or seven, probably around six. And she was on a motorcycle trip with her mother and her stepfather just outside of Hamburg and the sea. And in these photographs, you see her in the sidecar with her parents, or they're holding her aloft over their heads on their shoulders at the beach or at the sea. And both of those photographs, to me, were very iconic in certain ways because they're, they're the kind of street photography you would see all over the world at that particular moment in time. But they showed this jubilant family in the midst of a, a regime that was trying to annihilate both Black people and leftist activists. And that family <laughs> was a family of a young Black girl and a communist activist who was her stepfather. So these were two people who were incredibly endangered, but they were figured in public joyfully. And what brought me to think about listening to those images was looking beyond what we see. Because what we see is this vacationing couple and their child. But in the background, you see people watching them and you see people lingering in the frame, in and around the frame. And so I started thinking about if we resist <laughs> right, the temptation to simply allow that photograph to document something. And if we instead allow it, we listen to the sounds in it. Exploring the hidden stories behind photographs reminded us to bring intention into the way we consume media, especially images on a screen or even art that we feature here at the ICA Miami. But more so, it reminded us that even in the absence of sound or when sounds are quiet, listening is not only possible, it is vital. If we don't simply embrace the photograph for what it is showing, if we attune ourselves to it, and that's what I mean by listening to images, it's about attunement. If we attune ourselves to the fuller, the complicated registers that we are responding to in them, we get access to an entirely different or a much more complicated set of relationships. Listening beyond what we are seeing to unpacking the entire chain, what I call the social life of that image and how that social life has been brought to us, what implications it has on how we see both the images, the people in the images, but also those who those images reference. Yana, Nina, and Tina each helped us hear the depths hidden in quiet and underneath our preconceived notions of sound. Each, through their own ethical practices, transform listening from a passive stance to a radical act. 
We hope that this episode has encouraged you to approach your listening practice differently. So concludes our second season of Tomorrow is the Problem. This season, we attuned ourselves to the various soundscapes that make up our everyday lives. Musical, underwater, relational, and at times silent. Across each of these dynamic sonic worlds, we learn that listening is an ethical practice that will allow us to hear each other, the calls of nature, and the alighted histories of the past. To hear these worlds, we need to listen with more than our ears, and maybe we'll be able to hear in a different key. Thanks again for joining us this season, and stay tuned for season three. Tomorrow is the Problem is produced in partnership with Podfly Productions. This episode was produced and written by Isabel Lee and me, Donna Hanarpiche. It was edited by Francis Harlow, and our showrunner is Jocelyn Aram. Nina Pollock is our sound designer and mixing engineer. Special thanks to Nina Eidsheim, Jana Winderin, and Tina Kampt for joining us on the show. Thank you as well to Jana for providing her composition to score the show. And thanks also to Claudia Rankin for allowing us to use her work. And thank you as well to Bruno Hunger and Gregor Huber for letting us use their song Junk as our theme. I'm Donna Honarpiche. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.